We find ourselves in the middle of Lent. St. Benedict of Nursia, the spiritual father of the Benedictine family, spoke of the joy of Lent. In fact, it's the only time you find the word joy in the rule of St. Benedict. Why is that? It seems so counterintuitive. You don't associate Lent with joy, but with sadness. Wrong. Because the exercises that we are called upon for Lent are meant to bring not pleasure in a just transitory way, but a supernatural joy that helps us to see beyond these fleeting pleasures of the world. And so when we look to see the tradition of the church that is still alive, we can trace it back, well, to the Sermon on the Mount, where in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Jesus gives us not only his first sermon, but really the, the foundation of the whole Christian life. And when you get to the middle of that sermon, chapter 6, verse 1, you see a series of Lenten exercises that the church has always practiced and pointed the faithful to. The sequence is interesting, though, because the first in chapter 6 is when you give alms. And then the second one is when you pray. And then the third one is when you fast. So almsgiving, prayer, and fasting are the three principal exercises that lead us somewhat surprisingly, to the joy of Lent. But notice that Jesus doesn't say, if you give alms, if you pray, if you fast. Rather, he says, when you give alms, and when you pray, and when you fast. And then he draws a contrast. Don't do it so that others see you. Do it so that your Father in heaven knows that you are doing it precisely because you know yourself to be a beloved child of God. And then you're doing it to please him. We don't add anything to God when we give alms, when we pray, when we fast, but we open ourselves up for God to give much, much more of himself to us and then in turn to others because they're his beloved children too. And I think we also need to recognize how rooted and grounded this New Testament teaching is in the Old. Because the Sermon on the Mount begins, you'll recall, in chapter 5, with Jesus saying, don't think that I've come to abolish the Law and the Prophets, rather I've come to fulfill. And so our righteousness has to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, or else we're not going to enter into the Kingdom. But when we go back to the Old Testament, we realize how novel Jesus' teaching wasn't because what he was doing was really tapping into the, the wisdom tradition that we find, as well as the law of Moses in places like Deuteronomy 26 and elsewhere. But I want to recommend this practice of almsgiving especially because of our Lord commending it and commanding it, but also of, because of how it represents the spiritual roots of our faith as Christians who really represent the full flowering of our Jewish roots. I'm reading a book right now by Professor Gary Anderson, who's a friend of mine, but a brilliant biblical scholar for many people. Uh, he teaches at Notre Dame. Uh, he teaches Old Testament. And he's written this book simply entitled Charity, subtitled The Place of the Poor in the Biblical Tradition. And I'm not doing this as an advertisement for the book. I'm doing this because of the effect that this book is having on me as I'm going back reading and rereading sections that are challenging me to the very core of my being. Especially this one passage in Sirach, chapter 29, which he explains so profoundly and so practically. Help the poor for the commandment's sake, and in their need do not send them away empty-handed. Lose your silver for the sake of a brother or a friend. And do not let it rust under a stone and be lost. Lay up for yourself treasure according to the commandments of the Most High, and it will profit you much more than gold. Store up almsgiving in your treasury, and it will rescue from every disaster. Now, when you hear Sirach 29, 8 through 13, you recognize that Jesus was not being original. When he said, it, when he said in chapter 6, verse 19, there in Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and the, you know, thieves and rust and all of that. He's really echoing Sirach 29. And the point is that worldly wealth is good, but it's a relative good because it's finite and transitory. Eternal wealth is an absolute good because it's infinite. It is never ending. And so, in effect, when you give alms, you are doing what Proverbs 19.17 says. You are making a loan to God. It isn't just loaning money, expecting it to be repaid and maybe with interest. No. When you give to the poor, you are laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven, precisely because there's not necessarily going to be any earthly reward.
And when you look at Proverbs 19, 17, and you study this insight into the very mystery of God, you can especially see what Pope Francis is emphasizing in all of his teachings, especially the joy of the gospel, Evangelii Gaudium. And that is, God is a father. And that makes us his family. And that is not some quaint metaphor. That is the abiding truth and ultimate reality of everything in this world and beyond. And so only when we look at things through God's fatherly eyes do we see ourselves as beloved sons and daughters? Do we see others as brothers and sisters? And then we respond, especially to the widows and orphans who think we're bereft of family. We've got no kinsmen. And that's where we say, no, God the Father has shown us how beloved you are. And so it is that the poor in our towns and villages, and not just overseas where we can send some money, but where we can have concrete interaction with the poor, these are the people who represent Christ to us. Inasmuch as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. He who was rich, Paul tells us, became poor in order that we who are poor might share in his riches. And where do we find Christ? Well, in the Eucharist, in the community of faith, but especially in the poor in our own midst. And so, you know, in ancient Judaism, we have this rabbinic saying that the poor who would be begging in the streets would say, here, make yourselves rich to God by giving to me. You know, there's something pragmatic about that, but there's something penetrating and profound as well. It wasn't just a rhetorical strategy. It was an insight into the spiritual reality that is going to encompass us for all eternity. So enjoy Lent, you know, in all the ways that you do, but especially in the ways that Jesus prescribes and the church leads us to in almsgiving as well as prayer and fasting. Thank you so much.